actually a question, a question, but it's a request because this morning, I mean, I've been an art historian for quite a few years, but lining the painting never made sense to me. And it was actually Lisa who asked you guys what a wax lining was. Yeah, maybe. And she then told me, so I think it might be good to share it with the audience so they what, actually what know. Is what is a wax lining? Is. Why was it done? All of those things I think were really Well, I'll, start, I'll try, try to start and then I'll pass it to Bart because it's, the, it's that thing that we're so familiar with that I'm not always sure that I explain it in the clearest way. But a lining is when a, 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 another canvas, a second canvas, is attached to the back of the original. So it's it's like applying a backing to the original canvas. And it's done in order to give the original canvas greater support. And often with age, the original canvas might become more brittle and weak, especially along the edges. And um, so lining is done to give added support to the canvas. Uh, wax resin line, and there are many different kinds of lining depending on the type of adhesive that was used. So there's paste lining, glue lining, beva lining, there's wax resin lining. And in wax resin lining, wax resin is the adhesive, and those linings are done with the use of heat and pressure. And in the lining process, the wax resin mixture actually impregnates the entire structure of the painting. So this lining was often done when a painting was flaking, because it was kind of two in one. The lining gave extra support to the canvas, but the particular adhesive of wax resin would impregnate all the paint layers and actually consolidate the flaking paint. And it was also um, another benefit, I suppose, of wax resin lining was that it was thought to provide a moisture barrier. Um, but you know, it was carried too far, and too many paintings were subjected to this. And the problem is that it's really never completely reversible. It's, you can get a lot of the wax resin out, but not completely. And it had a deadening effect on the surfaces of Cubas paintings that were rac wax resin line. And also, the pressure flattened the impastos, and the wax went, the problem went all the way in the paint. So when the wax yellowed, the paint yellowed. Um, it also attracts dust and dirt. Um, yeah, uh, wax lining is maybe one of the most common ones in this area, and, but if you go to Italy, it would be more of a paste lining, which is not, not always as bad. But yeah, I think wax linings probably still happen, but very, very rarely, so. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I mean, in my opinion, we still, we conservators or we museum professionals still have a lot more work to do in terms of reversing some of these earlier treatments of Cubist paintings where they were sometimes mounted on solid supports. And um, so I think there's still more work to be done there. Uh, this is a question to any of our excellent speakers. Um, this time period seems to be a, a, a period of great change, change of the century, industrialization, World War One. I. I was wondering if any of the speakers would comment on how Cubism relates as following that trend, uh, being radical to that trend, implementing that trend, or however you see the Cubist movement in the political, social, economic time of the, thank you. Thank you. Christine, Anybody you're the senior up? faculty member. <laughs> 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 That's a really great and also very complicated and <laughs> difficult question, and I'm sure you would get very different answers from all of us and other people too, but um, I do feel that it, it is an historical moment of great transition. Um, on the one hand, you have the demise of the salon system of, ex of exhibiting works of art, and the authority of the academy seems to be greatly diminished in the early 20th century. Um, you have the rise of the independent salons and the Salon d'Automne, so artists are starting to organize themselves and exhibit in other venues without juries. So I think it's really significant to have the demise of a kind of traditional system of schooling and exhibition, changes in the market, all of which affect how artists imagine they will uh, learn, how they will uh, reach their public. And Picasso, and especially Picasso, but then Picasso, Brock, and Gris, enter the gallery system. I mean, this is just one small part of it, but I think they have contracts with Confiler. They don't submit to the annual salons. So there's a kind of possibility that opens up for them, which you might evaluate as positive or negative, but they 
Um, you know, they have a smaller circle of friends, poets, other artists, collectors, people like Gertrude Stein and all these poets, and they're addressing that smaller public. So I think one big factor is that the audience for art has shrunk. And, you know, in general, that's bad, but um, it seems to be a factor of modern life that there were many factors in that. Um, so that they can make more complicated intellectual work, they can be speaking to each other, and it's not the big salon painting with the historical theme. You know, these are smaller paintings meant for bourgeois collectors in their homes of a certain size and with a, a large degree of self-consciousness and I think humor and wit, but not something that's going to be open to the general public. So another thing, um, I really do believe that it's very significant that traditional artisanal skills are just being eroded and displaced by factory labor and the rise of photography and synthetic materials are coming in and the speed of labor is getting quicker. There's a kind of acceleration. So if you are living in the modern world, just as we today experience a lot of these changes, do you really want to write everything out by hand as I wrote out my notes for my own lecture, which I'm sure would strike any younger person as ridiculous? Um, or do you use the laptop? I mean, do you, you know, do you uh, sketch by hand or do you take a photograph? So I think even the speed of things, the technology that's generally available is shifting. And these artists begin to respond to that by, I think, in some ways, producing or using those synthetic materials, using stenciled letters, using, you know, the chair caning, doing all of these things which, in a sense, recognize how labor occurs in the modern age that they're in and at the same time combining it with the older techniques so that you have a collision of older and newer things and a kind of dissonance and it brings labor into view. For me it's very interesting to see older and newer forms of labor, of artisanal craft and newer technologies kind of just in dialogue. Um, so I think those are some of the factors. Um, there are many, many directions one could go. Somebody else could maybe yeah, add well, to I'll, this. I'll jump in here at some point and any of the rest of you feel free, but I mean, um, Clearly, these Cubist works are embedded in a particular history and a particular political moment as well. I think they, although some have claimed that they address, particularly in the, the newspaper articles pasted into some of the papier collé, that they address those events very specifically and directly, um, I, I, I'm inclined to think no. Um, they, again, they are political in a certain sense, but but in their own milieu, in their own world. Um, now, there are certainly direct consequences of World War I, for example, in that, in that Brock goes off to fight the war, and that brings Cubism as a movement to an end, effectively. Um, it certainly, it's a shared project. But, um, but the political works in these works in, in very subtle, subtle ways, it seems to me. Anybody want to add to that? Susan? Um, I, I don't I don't know um, Linda Dalrymple Henderson's work well enough to speak for her, but she, it has been linked to Cubism has been linked to the you know a discovery of the fourth dimension or an exploration of the fourth dimension. Um, but but also I might add what what was closer to my own work would be um, with certain discoveries about perception and uh, vision. There is a sense that um, reality gets thrown radically into question. In, um, in modern life in general. I mean, it's not just accelerations of speed and technology. It's, it's, it's about scientific discoveries, about the subjectivity of vision, vision being located in your brain so that reality as perceived is located, you know, is sort of uh, troubled. Um, we're not sure of truth anymore in modern, and, and I think that that's something that uh, cubism permits and explores. Firstly, thank you to all of our wonderful, wonderful speakers. Um, this really leads in very well to one of the main questions that I've had about this, which is that in so much of what we've heard today, I hear a lot of postmodernism <laughs> um, with the pervading sense of all that's melting into air found in um, the ambiguity of framing and the arbitrary nature of signification. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about um, not necessarily the political moment, but sort of how to orient this um, theoretically within modernism, just because I'm sort of concerned that uh, 
as a child of postmodernism, I'm kind of historiographically inappropriate here. <laughs> so um, anyone about that sort of? Thank you. If I could just clarify something really quickly about uh, about my own discussion of framing. Is this on or off? It's, it's on? Yeah. No, okay. It Couldn't tell. Um, which is that um, although uh, I do want to say that there are certain ways in which the, say, the outcome of Apollinaire's story about Gabriel Fernesun is uh, unknown to us, or that um, our interpretive work in front of, let's say, poor people by the seashore can't come to a conclusion about whether the boy is touching the man. I'm absolutely not proposing that meaning is indeterminate. If, uh, if there's a, you know, if there's a sort of postmodernist inflection to that claim, I'm completely, uh, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my, my whole point is uh, exactly that meaning is fixed and that the effects paintings produce in their empirical beholders are uh, external to the works themselves, that they're essentially your business. I think that um, uh, I always think of the Simpsons in this instance where Homer is doing Lollapalooza and there are two kids out in the audience watching him and they're both kind of dancing like this and one of them says, that guy's really cool, that guy on the stage. And the other one says to him, are you serious or are you being ironic? And to me, that's postmodernism, where you never quite know what the positionality is. But I think that you kind of point to an interesting thing, which is that postmodernism is not around unless modernism is here. It's always you know, a dialogue, I think. But one of the things that I, I, I think is interesting is to kind of tie in this business of, of science and also what you were saying, there's this investigation of, you know, we were talking about signs, you know, and, and language sort of being pulled apart and figuring out how your brain makes sense of certain things and why we all agree that CAT makes cat. Um, I think that there is a position you know, there is a place from which these works start, but, and if they didn't refer back to these kind of academic traditions or these other kinds of things that were just raised, um, they wouldn't have a kind, there wouldn't be a conversation, let's say. These things that we're talking about with the tension and, you know, the inside, the outside, and so on. I think that all of those things, um, th they put meaning in play, but they, they do it against something, either a frame or however you want to construct it. And I would say that that might be one of the differences. And, and just to get my two bits in, oh, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that much of what we tend to think of or m much of what passes as, as, you know, sort of postmodern actually does begin much earlier um, and, and is the result of a, a too monolithic conception of the modern. I think if, if we, we had a richer, fuller, sharper understanding of modernism, we m might be able to dispense with that term postmodernism altogether or figure out something. Else. Okay, and I, and I think that's, you know, even though I, you know, um, we might want to shove indeterminacy of meaning out of the way, um, you know, along Charles's lines. But I think, I think, you know, the the, you know, the roots of much of again what passes as postmodern, I think, comes from the early 20th century, if not, if not earlier. So yeah. Um, what I was thinking about when you asked your question was how interesting it was that you started it with a quote from Marx from the middle of the 19th century: "All the <laughs> solid melts into air." And I think that really is to do with the conditions of modernity as they're sort of developing, you know, from the late 19th century into the tw early 20th century, that there is really a sense that people are seeing their world change so fast due to industrialization that they really are unmoored, you know, and in the, in the middle of the 19th century, there are literally people who lived before the trains and after the trains, before the factories and after the factories, and that sort of 
that sense of just absolutely having the rug pulled out from under you, I think is connected to, in really deep ways, to the kinds of experimentations that happen in painting. And thinking about that, I was thinking about Christine Poggi's um, sort of description of tactility. There was a kind of idealistic, fully tactile painting that was haunting your, your um, <laughs> talk, which I guess would be a completely illusionistic painting, where you felt like you could grasp the things because they were well enough described. And I kept having this feeling like, well, yes, but it, isn't that also a completely optical painting? And doesn't it also actually have an instrumental purpose a lot of the time, so that people who are looking at those paintings, rather than stopping before them and paying attention to them, are just reading through them. And so then, you know, that, so then I was sort of trying to figure out, well, what is taptic, tactic, tactile and what is optical, and how does that fit with the development of, of you know, modernism, artists experimenting with the means of painting? And I was really struck by Lisa's um, just using, bringing up that thingness of things with Heidegger, um, I think Merleau-Ponty on Cezanne brings this up also in slightly different terms, but this idea that as the word world becomes more instrumentalized, as we have more and more mass production of things, as the things that decorate our homes are mass produced, and as we sort of use them in a more instrumental way, that art does start to try to stop us. And then the question is, for me, kind of thinking about cubism, the way we've been talking about it is that it's trying to stop us to get us to pay attention to it as art. Right. You know, we're right. paying attention to the fracture of the surface and the way that it's taking apart the various things like line and shading and breaststroke and then putting them back together in a way that we're unfamiliar with, so we have to pay attention to it as art. But then there's the fact that we have these everyday objects in there too. And I guess my question is, are we also supposed to think about those objects? Like, is it trying to de-instrumentalize things that we use every day or not? And if it was, I guess we could see that as a political move, yeah. you know, yeah. or a comment on the modern condition. Right. Um, and I don't really know what to say about that, because sometimes I just think they're like flippant jokes, and sometimes I think, well, this is so profound, the way right. this is getting me to right. think about how I understand the world. Right. So. Right. That, that was really well said. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, first, I just wanted to say really quickly that I, I, I hoped in, in my talk to, make, um, to get across the idea that I thought there really was a significant difference between somebody like Tony Smith and yeah. real modernism. Yeah. Right? Um, there is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then um, there's... Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a movement out of which uh, Picasso came, um, like historically speaking, in Catalonia, uh, that I think shows, uh, uh, shows a little bit about what was at stake for him in uh, the advent of modernity. Uh, in fact, the first movement I know of, the earliest movement I know of that refers to it as, itself as modernism, uh, happened in Catalonia. Uh, and one of the, the sort of leading lights of modernismo uh, was uh, Santiago Rusignol. And he, um, he, wrote, he wrote a little story that's a sort of parable about, uh, about art. It's about a, uh, about a band of wandering players who go through the countryside and stop in small towns and put on a little show and uh, try to attract a little attention and a little money. And uh, this sort of sensitive young local intellectual falls in love with the singer in the troupe. And she's got him completely within uh, her spell, right? And in a way, she very obviously just sort of stands for poetry, stands for art. And uh, the various members of her, uh, of her troupe, they stand for coercion, they stand for commerce, they stand for everything else that could be understood as political or worldly. Um, the strong man uh, uh, coerces people uh, by beating them up. The uh, clown uh, tries to trick people out of money. She's the only one who can really stand for art. And in the end, uh, she refuses to let him follow her. She refuses, uh, she refuses his devotion. In the end, she sings this song, you know, asking uh, that art be given its proper tribute. And uh, he, puts a, he, puts a, he puts a penny 
in the, uh, in the cup they pass, and she sees that, that he's exactly gotten it wrong, that he totally didn't understand. So I agree with you, actually, that I think what modernism is about in a certain way is establishing a kind of authority for, uh, for art that will transcend the sort of encroaching uh, instrument, instrumentalism of, uh, of modernity. Charles is going to have the last word, is that possible? <laughs> do, do you have any more that you'd like to throw at us, or shall we? One more. Uh, just for fun, I wonder if you all think cubism is a fortunate or unfortunate label. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think that the, the quintessentially cubist works, the ones that earn the movement its name, actually we didn't show any of those. The paintings from Horta de Hebro and uh, um, the heads of Fernand, I think. Um, yeah, so um, maybe unfortunate for today's proceedings, but I don't know, it'll do well enough. What do you think? <laughs> I don't think I don't think it so. helps us understand the paintings better, though. So in that in that sense, I think it's a confusing term, but I think we're stuck with it. Yeah. But it's kind of like Prince, isn't it? Because <laughs> seeing as how nobody really understands precisely what is motivating it, there is no name that can designate it and contain it. So you know, the, we the might movement as well, formerly known the as Cubism, formerly known as Prince. <laughs> It's true. I, I actually remember going in the Musée Picasso, going through a box of his stuff, and he had a, a postcard that was actually a game where, you know, this cartoonish figure was holding up cubes that would go, if you looked at it one way, you'd see it concave, and the other way it would sort of, you know, be volume. And um, he'd written something on the back, but I think that Picasso himself actually sort of enjoyed that that moniker and played with it quite a bit, actually. Um, the thing that I object to usually with the term is, and maybe it isn't invited by the term, but I don't like this sort of multitude of angles, you know, you, like we're walking around something and seeing all sides of it at once. Um, there was a kind of cubism that was being shown in the, in the exhibition, you know, salons, um, that was closer to that. But I think that what Picasso and Brock, I think there was interchange and there were different gradations, but I think that they were not doing that exactly. And the problem with cubism is it kind of invites this idea of there's a cube and it's then opened up and we get to see all sides of it. So in that sense, I think it's kind of unfortunate, but as Jenny was saying, it's historical and, you and know. The, yeah, and the other thing that I th think mention here is that um, one of the results of the difficulty of understanding cubism, and particularly given Picasso's and Brock's silence on the subject early on, is that you got all of these, you know, essentially false interpretations floating around out there, but they were tremendously productive. So I think that misinterpretation spawns futurism. And uh, the, the paintings done at Catechez that, that look for all intents and purposes, you know, objectless. Um, Mondrian sees them and he's off and running, you know. So, um, so even in these misinterpretations, I think, you know, that there's, there's good stuff. <laughs> Anybody else? Going once? <laughs> well, if, if not, then I'd just like to thank you all for your dedication all day long. Um, I hope you enjoyed our program. I know I certainly Really, it's been a delightful experience with all of you, and I want to thank each one of you for taking the time, your valuable scholarship, and contributing to this part of our experiment. But I hope you have a very pleasant weekend.